Cat in the Box needed two plays for us to review it, and I cannot imagine that more play will change my opinion of this game. It will probably change my heuristics, and, like, I'll figure out how to be good at it, but uh, Cat in the Box impossible. is such an elegant, well-designed, trick-taking game that I'm just going to say it's S-tier right now. I bought a copy, like, immediately after I got home it's, from PAX. I mean, it's up there, right? It's, you know, so... We played a lot of trick-taking games, especially a lot of the small Japanese ones that seem to be a whole trend, right? You know, we've talked about there's the there's the scared ghost one, and there's the the high food one, and you know, there's just so many, right? Um, you know, there's and there's the classic ones, you know, your wizard tarts, spades, whist, all those. Your uh, anyway, but this one is really different in terms of what Rim just said. It, the level of polish, it is so streamlined and so straightforward. It doesn't have any, like, weird gotchas or anything, you know, like, yep. oh, you can only trump on the, 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 the second moon of the third. <laughs> yep. like, or no, there's no you, weird if anything. You, if you have formed a coalition with a player who chose the trump, then, you, then the other coalition forms the alternate trump, like, moon. None of that crap. Yeah, I feel like a lot of trick-taking games, even ones that are pretty smooth, they have one little quirk, at least one, like quirk or gotcha that makes them a little rough rules-wise, yep. right? Even if they have something, you know, and some of them, which I think are smooth, don't have like a strategy or a, you know, anything to crunch your brain on decision-wise. Like yep. they're just sort of straightforward. Like you draw your hand, you, it's easy to figure out the best way to play that hand and... We win or lose based on the draw. The yep. end. Right? Now, sometimes that becomes crunchy if you get good at the game and start counting or, you know, like you gain some skill. Sometimes they become crunchy until you're good at the game. But yeah. uh, I guess we're about to describe the rules because the game is so simple. But what I'll say The game is, is so simple, I can teach you the entire rules and I will do so. Yep. But right? a point before, uh, I have rarely seen a trick-taking game that is so quick to teach to a table yep. where nobody makes a mistake like god damn did everyone understand how to play this game after about three minutes of instruction especially because you already had some trick taking knowledge yeah but even if you don't i think you could learn it very quickly this like, could i be like the kozu dice first... but this is like a breath of fresh air right the only reason i like this could be someone's first trick taking game the only reason i think you wouldn't want it to be is because the genius of it shines when you have the understanding of a trick-taking game and you see how this is a twist on that formula and you, it's sort of like you can appreciate it, right? Whereas if you, you could just play this never having taken a trick in your life, but you wouldn't have a full appreciation for what they've done here. Um, so, so how does this game work? It's really simple. There's a deck of cards numbered one through nine and every number, there are five copies. So five ones, five twos, Five nines, right? There's 45 cards. Yep. And you, you deal out the cards to all the players. Now, I guess it's very important to note, these cards are all the same. All the fives are the same. They're all just black. Yeah, there's no suits. It's just numbered one through one through nine. Just deal out the cards. And you deal them out, and everyone now has a hand, and everyone picks a card to sort of get rid of, right? They just throw it out of the game, basically. Like So now you know, let's say I have a, a one in my hand, and I throw it out. Well, now I know that there's only four ones left in the game total, right? Because there were five. There could be even less than four, but I know that there are less than five ones available in the total deck because I threw one out, right? Okay, and then you start playing a trick-taking game, a very normal trick-taking game. You play a card. Everyone has to follow suit. Whoever has the highest in that suit wins, unless someone didn't have that suit, in which case they can play a different suit. If that, if they play the Trump suit, then they would win, right? Again, even against someone who had, it's just basic trick-taking game. Nothing weird about it whatsoever. Completely normal. Not one weird rule at all. None. No special anything. Red. The red suit is Trump. But wait. Didn't you just say that all the cards are all black? There's no suits on them? Well, when right? you play a card, you play yep. it on a little like cardboard thing in front of you, and you decide what its suit is at the moment you play it. Right, so I play a five, and I say, this five is yellow. I decided it. When I play it, at the moment I play it, I decide. I can pick any suit I want, and I say, it's five, yellow. It's yellow. And what I do when I do that is I take a little marker, 
and there's a board, and the board has 45 slots on it. One for every card. And I put a marker on the yellow five. Now, someone else might have a five in their hand, and they might want to play it. Well, they can. No problem. They just can't say it's yellow because, well, the yellow five already got played. Because right? remember, the name of this game fully is Cat in the Box, and then subtitle, Quantum Trick-Taking Game. Because the rule is... You can only play one real card, meaning a yellow five. There's only one yellow five. You can't play a card that has already been played, the combo of number and color. It's a riff on Schrodinger's cat. Yep. So you, everyone goes around playing a trick taking game. So I play a yellow five, right? Well, now it's Rim is to the left of me. All right, so Rim, I guess he has to follow suit. So now, if he plays a... If he plays a two, he's got to say yellow. He can't be like red two. Well, right? I could be red two, but I have to then first say, oh, no, I'm out of yellow. That sucks. Right. And then I take a marker off my board showing that I'm, quote, out of yellow. And I play some Which other Which means suit. that for the rest of the, the that round, Rim can never play another yellow card because he said he didn't have any yellows yeah. left. If I right? if I desuit myself by just declaring I've desuited, I am tied to that for the rest of the hand. And if it turns out that yellow is literally the only play I have left for one of my cards, I'm just effed. Right. So that's the final thing is like you you play cards, you decide the suit when you play them, and when you decide the suit, you can only choose a suit for that card that hasn't been played by any other player, and you can't choose a suit if you have already declared yourself to be desuited in that, right? And then if someone is in a position where all the cards remaining in their hand have no legal play, then that person has caused a paradox and they lose and they get boned and they lose points. Otherwise, everyone gets a point for every trick they took. Yep. Uh, at the beginning of each round, you can bid on like how many tricks you think you're going to take. But your options you take, are just like one, two, or three. Like it's yeah, not. Yeah, you can't. Right. So if you go over three, that doesn't matter. But if you hit exactly the bid that you made, then you get bonus points equal to like these markers on the. It's not, so, you know, it's like a, uh, a bonus Basically, point when you play, you know, the yellow five uh, and you put the marker on yellow five and say later you play a. I don't know, yellow six or a blue five or whatever's next to it on that chart, on that uh, marker board orthogonally. Uh, whatever your bonus points, if you hit your bid, are the total number of your markers that is largest of a contiguously orthogonally adjacent set. So if yeah, I make so a big blob of like eight of them, daddy eight points, and I probably definitely won the entire game because that's right, nuts. Right, but it's like you have an incentive to pick colors you know, suits such that your markers on the board are orthogonally adjacent. So you want to make runs in the same suit. You want to be like, I played the yellow four and the yellow five and the yellow six. Or you also want to pick, right? Like I played the yellow four and the blue. Well, you, there's two. There's the easy side of the board. I was about to say there's like, a, there's an easy baby mode and there's a the mode, really yeah. good mode. In the baby mode, everything's lined up. So you can just be like blue four, yellow four, green four, right? blue five and make a blob that way but in the hard mode everything's offset a little bit so you can still make runs like three four five in the same suit yep. but if it's like you want to be like blue two yellow three green four that would make a vertical column so so the only other rule and it's a standard trick-taking rule you can't lead the trump suit unless it's been broken like that's it yep. and that's a totally normal that's not a gotcha that's just a regular old trick taking thing like trick taking and that's the whole game that's the whole game you play several rounds he has the most points the end and it's great uh i yeah. won of the two games we played i came in second place by one point in the first game and i won the second game but i don't think that was my the first game that was luck but i do have some heuristics like there is some skill here and i think play can right. evolve based on what I noticed in the two games we played. I'm I am ashamed to admit it took me several games to learn the most basic fact is, right? And so I'm going to teach it to you so you don't fuck it up. Oh, it's then, so I, then I'll teach obvious. the thing I figured out in right. game two. This is so simple and obvious. I should have figured it out bef as soon as I heard the rules. It took me several games to understand this. That there are five copies of any number in the deck, right? And you could only... So there are five fours, right? In the whole deck. If... Four fours get played. Obviously, the fifth one can never be played. Otherwise, trouble. If you start in your opening hand and you've got more than one four or more than one two, 
and you take one of them and throw it out at the start, then you know the other one is perfectly safe. You can always, as long as you don't desuit yourself and, and stupidly, right? Yep. You'll know that you can safely play that other one, right? So if you draw in your opening hand like three threes, obviously you should probably throw away one of the threes. And now you know for sure those other two threes are safe and you can just sort of hold them till the end of the round. And you won't paradox that way. Try to get all the other cards. If you got like one four in your opening hand, okay, keep it, but try to play it quickly. That way you can get it out. And if no one else is throwing away a four and there's a dangerous paradoxical four out there, at least it's not in your hand. So, And I paradoxed like often when I started playing. And it's once I understood this. I stopped paradoxing basically. I entirely. only paradoxed once and it was a zero, a negative zero paradox. I was okay on that one. Yeah. But uh, so my slightly more advanced heuristic that like worked so well, it's kind of like when you showed how you were winning Citadels and everyone was like, oh, fuck, that's oh, why Scott Mine was wasn't winning. even a heuristic. It was just like a basic fact. <laughs> like, yep. It was so, it's so simple. I don't know how I didn't understand that from the game. My one, baby but. heuristic that is the sole reason I won that second game and will definitely not work again was whatever number every single player played first, unless there was like a weird situation with like, you know, like someone leads something really high first round, whatever they play, I assumed they were trying to get rid of it because they have more than one in their hand. So no, that's not. You would get rid of it early because you don't have more than one in your hand. Well, no, because they no, say, no, meaning they have more than one in their hand after throwing stuff away, and they're trying to get rid of the most dangerous card in their hand. That, those are, but if you if you have multiple numbers of a card in your hand, say you have two fours you, in your hand after you threw stuff away. But I would have thrown away one of the fours. What if you have three fours and three ones when you have to decide what to throw away? That's really weird. Really common. That's like that a really all the unlucky time. draw. But I had uh, draws okay. like that every game. But yeah, if you have it, what you the other thing is that when you get to the end of the round, you don't play your final card. So really, yeah. you can save two cards. So if I had three ones and three fours, I would throw away a one at the start, because or maybe throw away a four at the start, yep. and then one of the ones. I would just sort of say, this is the card I'm not going to play this round no matter what. And now I know that the ones and the fours are all safe to play. And I would put those also deprioritize playing those and try to get all the other cards played first. I went harder. I know that those are the dangerous and risky ones. Because the fact that if someone paradoxes, the hand ends immediately. Yep. I won the second game because every time someone paradoxed, I, almost every time, I would have been forced to paradox if it got around to me. But someone paradoxed before. I aggressively tried to make someone paradox, and the way I oh would, yeah, and the way I would do that, especially is, the turn order matters a lot too, especially toward, on the final round. Like if you can see, because everyone's gonna deal one hand, yep. right? So if you say, okay, I'm the first dealer in the first round, and then that means on the last round, I will be going second, and so. I'm probably relatively safe because you're not going to paradox before the last round unless you're really bad, right? It happened so, a couple times though. You can get you can just get screwed by the colors or like being forced to desuit or something. It's possible, but it's like on that final round, it's like okay, I'm going to be going second. I'm kind of safe, but I can probably do. I can obviously be in a position of power to really hurt. Right. The, the third yep. and fourth players. Like if I see that, like if I look at that board on that final turn and I see that like three uh, threes have been used and I've got the fourth three, it's like, I'll play that. And it's like, all right, so be a three. What do you got? <laughs> so what I did, and this was super effective, just saying in these early games, I don't think it'll last because obviously this is easily defeated. Whoever in the first hand, whatever number I look at all the numbers, everyone who did not lead played. I pick one of those players, and uh, especially if I have one or two of that number, and I do the same thing like pushing spades and hearts. I play that number at my next opportunity to try to force them into a corner by getting to the point where I hope they had two threes, let's say. They got rid of one. I force other threes out to try to get to the point to where all four threes are taken up. So now they've got a liability in their hand. And I mean, filling up filling up a number in general is going to force someone, right? Is going to create the most dangerous situation yep. for someone, right? It, but you know, it's, if all, but it's so I would try to keep two five, of a number, which is highly right. risky, like two fives. Someone plays a five, I play a five. My next two cards are fives, just try to fuck well, them. Well, if over. you have two fives and you haven't shoved one under at the start, I will right? keep one sometimes. It's like 
Right. Well, it's like you you know that if you keep one of them to the end, you're safe. But if you can play both, then you know you've definitely probably put the hurt on somebody. Exactly. And right. I played this game both times the same way I play hearts. I don't try necessarily to minimize my score so much as I try to fuck over other players and force them into bad situations. And that's just how I pl often play trick-taking right. games. And it's highly effective in two plays. I think, right. Of this I think game. the worst right, the worst draw I think in this game would actually be like three pair, right? Because you you let's say you got three ones, two yep. twos, two one, two threes, two fours. I can hide a two at the start. I can save a three at the end. And it's like, well, I've got two fours and I have to play them both. Right. If I had and that situation, I would aggressively desuit like early on purpose, which you remember, I desuited way early and everyone was like, whoa, and I won. So, but, uh, but it's like, I would try, I would play those fours, right? I would try to play them quickly so that, you know, because there, there's a risk that there could be five of them out there. I right? would, in, in that the, situation, in if I had like three pairs, I would aggressively desuit to try to get them all out on purpose because early, quickly, because. If you have those cards and you're playing with the skewed board, then that lines up into an extremely orthogonally adjacent pile of points that is worth the risk. Hmm. You could have yeah, like a seven, eight, nine point hand, and that'll probably win you the whole thing. It's worth going for Maybe. it. Of right, course, if you, you paradox, know, the problem is if you de the problem is desuiting too early, you might end up hurting yourself because it's like okay, I know for sure that there are I've, I I ditched a one at the start and I've got a second one, yep. and I know there's only four ones out there, right? And I desuit you know in blue or something, and then every one gets played except the blue one, and I'm the only I've this is the only one that's left because I ditched one of them. Yep. But I can't play it because I desuited blue too early, and now I screwed myself. Yep. Right? So and I guess what the, I'm that's saying that's the is, risk you take when you desuit too early. And that you know, I played a very aggressive, high risk strategy in a game where everyone else at the table was playing very safely and conservatively. So I want to see what happens if someone else goes as aggro as I go, and I imagine we both get fucked over, and someone else wins. Right. Well, I just I didn't under you know I think the thing is. At, in those early games, right? I was trying to play safe, but I wasn't playing safe because I didn't understand how to play That's safe. That's true. That's true. And I just explained how to play safe is to just realize as long, you know, there are five of each card. If you ditch one at the start or the end, then all other cards of that number are safe. As long as you don't hurt yourself by desuiting a color too early, then it's, you can, and you, then you know which, you can separate your hand into the numbers that could paradox and the numbers that can't paradox. You guys realize, you know why we were able to get such heuristics and figure stuff out so quickly with two plays in this game or other trick-taking games? We played with a bunch of smart people several times in a row. Well, I only played twice, but not just that. It's because... played three or four times. Without suits, counting cards is trivial. Everyone at the table can have a full count in uh, their what head. Do you mean, what do you mean counting cards? There's a board that shows you which cards exactly. have been played with little gems. So, playing <laughs> like, this game... You don't have to count anything. Exactly. So, playing this game lets you, as a player, who may not necessarily count cards in, like, hearts or wizard or something else, feel what it's like to play a trick-taking game if you were counting cards. Mm. That yeah, like is you the just magic look at of this, this game, board, and I yeah, just you look at the board, it. and you can see like I got a yellow six, and you look at the board, and it's like it shows you that the yellow seven and eight have already been played, and you're like yellow six. Oh, you have a six, not a yellow six, yep. but you make it a yellow six because you've seen that the seven and the eight have already been played, and there's you know, and it's like well. That's you know what can beat that unless yep. they break and, and play. The only Trump, hidden so. in, the only information you have to keep track of really is what card did you throw away because that's the only information you have other than your hand that no one else has. Yep. Exactly. So and this the, is, well, the inf and you, I guess the other inf you would love to know what everyone else threw away. That yeah. would be super valuable information. <sighs> so uh, yeah, I want you could probably take other trick taking games as a teaching exercise to make the count on a board like this so people could experience what hearts is like if like everyone was counting cards that I feel like you could just play you could just play like one hand of wizard right until yep. everyone understands it just play wizard until everyone gets it and then just immediately switch to this instead yeah right? <laughs> and be like, I think Whoa. this game I think this game is going to be a big hit with my family too mm, like I I'm think anyone who is a trick taking game enjoyer should add this one like if you're only going to have like five trick taking games on your shelf. It's like, you know, besides regular deck of cards. Yep. It's like it's probably this one, you know, a wizard, 
maybe the high fu one, the yep. Nukosu dice. Like those are the top ones that I've that I've done. So a Fuji flush, yep. I guess if that counts. Moo is a is an elevated experience that is not for everyone. Yeah, but it's I like, like Moo, but I can't. I'm not good at it. Maybe the stick gown, maybe it's like Ooh, it's up there. Maybe thing is, I really like stick gown, but I haven't played it in so long. Yeah, but like this one is a. The bu- last think, time we you know, played Shikhelm was at the PAX where the the seventh guest w- arrived. Yeah, but the point is the cat one is above the stick elms and the of the world, right? Yeah. So well, Shikhelm, I don't know if I like it because it's good, or I like it because it's almost an inversion. Like it's such the opposite of everything trick taking games stand for. It's like it's like the deconstruction of a trick taking game. So I don't know if it's good or if it's just so novel that I'm obsessed yeah. with it. It might not be good. But anyway, also, you know, coming up with this genius and also the deluxe edition that we were playing has very nice pieces, all these cute little gems with like, you know, cat related and science related items. Oh, yeah. The game, Um, the style is just great. The cute little cat with the little like chromatic aberration. This game's just a gem. Yep. So excellent game and it's not expensive and it's not large, which is great. Oh, and I guess we, we wanted to mention uh, the game was published by Hobby Japan. It's a Japanese game. Oh, yeah, uh, right. Who was, the, who was the designer again? Oh, the designer. Oh, I got to go back. I was clicking around in photos of the game for the live stream while we were talking. Yeah. The designer of this game, Muneyuki Yokuchi. Okay, but well, yeah, uh, good job to that person. Uh, but the thing I learned thanks to this game is I thought Hobby Japan was a magazine, right, which it is, I guess, Uh you know, about, like, Gundam modeling and stuff like that. But apparently, Hobby Japan is, like, a publisher of, like, many different nerdy things in Japan, not just a magazine. Um, Most Euro pu- games, like, it's it's a... Uh, if you like, buy D&D in Japan, it's, like, translated and locally published by Hobby Japan. They've like, even what? got the distribution rights to Advanced Squad Leader. <laughs> yeah, it's like, I didn't realize Hobby Japan was this whole publishing company. I thought it was just a magazine. But nope, it's a whole publishing company. They publish lots of stuff over there, including board games, including this tabletop game. So that's pretty cool. 